At our church, Jesus is Lord. That single belief calls us together as a community and sends us into our world with hope and purpose. At our church, your past will never define your future. There's always redemption, which means there's always a brighter day. At our church, we don't think we're better than any other church out there. We're just doing our best to become our best. At our church, we want you to believe in God, but we also want you to know that God believes in you. We are not against people who don't attend church anywhere. Instead, we pursue them with love, the very same love that's pursuing us. At our church, we're learning to serve God with all our hearts and we're learning to worship Him with all our lives. And if you're looking for the perfect church, we're not it. At our church, we will make mistakes, but we will choose to grow from them. At our church, we're part of a global community that's knit together by the resurrection of Jesus. And by the way, at our church, we believe that really happened too. At our church, we will engage with people who are in real need because we are the hands and the feet of Christ. And finally, we need you to hear this loud and clear. At our church, it's not really our church at all. It's His. And we live and move and breathe in His church for His glory and His fame, not ours. So here's the invitation. You're invited to jump in with your whole heart at your own pace and to experience the life that awaits you in Christ. Friends, this is going to be good. Welcome to our church. Isaiah 41, 1 through 14 says this. Be silent before me, you islands. Let the nations renew their strength. Let them come forward and speak. Let us meet together at the place of judgment. Who has stirred up one from the east, calling him in righteousness to his service? He hands nations over to him and subdues kings before him. He turns them to dust with his sword, to windblown chaff with his bow. He pursues them and moves on unscathed by a path his feet have not traveled before. Who has done this and carried it through? calling forth the generations from the beginning. I, the Lord, with the first of them and with the last, I am He. The islands have seen it in fear and the ends of the earth tremble. They approach and come forward. They help each other and say to their companions, be strong. The metal worker encourages the goldsmith and the one who smooths with the hammer spurs on the one who strikes the anvil. One says to the welding, it is good. The other nails down the idol, so it will not topple. But you, Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen, you descendants of Abraham, my friend. I took you from the ends of the earth. From its farthest corners I called you. I said, you are my servant. I have chosen you and have not rejected you. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. All who rage against you will surely be ashamed and disgraced. Those who oppose you will be nothing as nothing and perish. Though you search for your enemies, you will not find them. Those who wage war against you will be as nothing at all. For I am the Lord your God, who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, Do not fear, I will help you. Do not be afraid, you worm, Jacob, little Israel, do not fear, for I myself will help you, declares the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Let us, let us pray together. Dear Lord, today in this moment we thank you for the opportunity to hear your word, to share your word, to spread your word. It is my hope today that each and every person here hear the word that you would have me speak and not my words. Lord Jesus, we thank you again for the opportunity to come here freely without persecution. And Lord, help us to never forget who we are in Christ Jesus. In your holy name we pray. Amen. So, this scripture talks about a lot of things. There's a lot entangled in this scripture. But I think it's important that we, we talk about who Isaiah was for a moment because oftentimes we talk about the New Testament 
We talk about Jesus. We talk about, you know, the epistles and even Revelation sometimes. But Isaiah is, I'll say Isaiah is probably my favorite in the Old Testament. Because he is able, and he does throughout the book of Isaiah, through God the Father, predicts the coming of Jesus Christ. Who he would be, what he will do, and who he is. Isaiah, we quote a lot from uh, that type of thing when we're talking about the prophecy of Christ. A lot of times around Christmas time, we quote him, and Easter time, we quote him because those are the big Jesus times, right? When we talk about God and we talk about who he is and how he came and he was born of a virgin and he, he was hung on a cross for us. And, you know, we, we know that story and we've heard it. But it's interesting, if you read through the book of Isaiah you'll find a lot of things that maybe don't make sense on the surface to you, but they make all the sense when you shed them in the light of Christ and who he is. And one of those such examples is Isaiah 5, Isaiah 53, verse 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. How many of you ever heard that, sir, that, that scripture before? And how many of you ever heard the scripture that I read this morning? Okay. So, that, that goes to show. We've, we've, we know a lot of the scriptures, but to put a number to it, and I did not know this before I did the sermon prep here, there are 355 total prophecies about Jesus Christ in the Old Testament, from Genesis to the beginning of Matthew. And so, 124 of them are found... In Isaiah alone. The interesting thing about that is, is that if you are up on your math, you'll realize that that's a little over ha a third. Excuse me, it's about 38ish percent. My aunt will correct me at dinner later on today, uh, but that's okay. I'm going to say it's around 38 percent. So Isaiah is a pretty big deal when we talk about the Old Testament and we talk about Jesus' coming and who Jesus is and what Jesus would become. So. Stacy, would you go back to where it uh, starts with uh, 10, please? Verse 10. So I want to look at this. I want to look at verse 10 and 13 specifically today because the whole chapter, or the whole, I'm sorry, the whole scripture verses that we read today, that 14 verses or so there, talks about Israel. He's talking about Israel. He's very emphatic about Israel. We know that because he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob is mentioned here. So that is the God that we serve. That is the Jewish God. And of course we serve Jesus, but we'll get to that a little bit later. So verse 10 says this, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. And 13 says, For I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, Do not fear. I will help you. The title of the message this morning is Dream Big and Don't Quit. Dream Big, Don't Quit. Two very closely related topics. And we're going to link them together hopefully this morning. Hopefully when we leave we'll feel this way. Um, but today, those two scriptures, those two verses that I just read, create a pinnacle and a, and a cornerstone, if you will, for us to build this message. The first way that we as Christians can dream big, should dream big, and never give up is by remembering that God is with us. He's taking our right hand. He's walking with us. He's not giving up on us. And He's always seeing us through. I think that a lot of us, sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we forget just who the God that we serve is and how powerful he is. And how that when we get in some situations, we can always reach out to him. And I think that not only us here in our personal life, I'm sure that if we talked about our personal lives, we could find something. But if we think about the church as a whole, and I don't mean just non-denomination, I mean every, all, you know, all the Christian churches, I think that we've forgotten that fact of how powerful God really is in that he's with us. Whenever God calls us to do something, we must be willing to do it. A good example here would be Pastor Robin and Code Blue. Big example. That's a big undertaking. I know 
I don't know all of what happens with it, but I know a lot of what happens with it, and I'm telling you, it's just amazing how it just works. It's amazing how it works. But Pastor Robin was able to, you know, use the power of God and work. God was able to work through Pastor Robin and make those amazing things happen. And you saw, actually, in the beginning of service, if you were paying attention there, the, the video talked about all the things that w we had done in the past year. You know, with the meal serve, the showers, and those are rough numbers, but they're pretty accurate, actually. So that is all done through us and the power of God in us. And if we look outside again to the churches outside of Bethany Grace, as I was preparing for this, I thought about a church, right? And, and it was kind of funny because my mom and I, we went to this church a couple of years ago to visit a pastor friend of ours. And it was just a little tiny church, little tiny church, middle of nowhere. And you go in and there's like a little entrance way. And there is, uh, when you go through the entrance way, there is the sanctuary and that's it. That's your church, which was fine. And uh, so we went in there, we sat through the service, and uh, it was nice. But as I looked around and I saw things, I realized that probably the youngest person in that church was, I would say, 75 or, or, or thereabouts. And it was sad because I know the pastor and I know that she was trying to make things work, you know, get things done, use what God had called her to do, but it just wasn't happening. So they were in a rut. And... So I think that a lot of that goes back to the first thing that we talked about, the power of God. If people would realize that the power of God is with us, how much more could we do? We could do amazing things. And on a purely comedic note, uh, that same church when we went there, I, I, <laughs> I remember at the end of service, I went up to the pastor's husband and I asked him, I said, where's the restroom? Because I had to go to the bathroom. That's what we all do after service. And so... I went down and I said, where's the restroom? And he says, oh, it's outside. I said, it's outside? Really? He says, yeah, he says, it's outside. I said, you've got to be kidding me. And he goes, no. He said, there's no indoor plumbing. I said, no indoor plumbing? Really? And he said, no. I said, okay. And as I'm walking away, I'm thinking to myself, well, I'll hit Wawa or McDonald's on the way home. I'm not going out in this, this porta potty So I thought I would look at it when we left. I look at it and it is a... <laughs> It looks just like a porta potty, but it's got like a it's in like a wooden shack, and um, the the real funny part about it was it was at the beginning of their cemetery, and it's like so you had to go and you're like going to the bathroom and you like hear something and you don't know what's going on and you look outside, it's just a really creepy situation, but that's but that is that is what I think is lacking, that this church didn't even have indoor plumbing, like that's a big deal, right? But because they couldn't find the vision of God, they couldn't get into the groove of God, they didn't remember God's power, they had some issues. That was actually probably the least of their issues, but it was an issue to me because I'm used to having three restrooms downstairs. Uh, so back to Isaiah. Isaiah is something that if you haven't read, I do encourage you to read it because I just think it's a wonderful, wonderful scripture. So the first thing... A pillar off of that, the pillar of the message, one of the pillar of the messages this morning is remember that God is with you. Remember that God is taking your hand. Remember that God is walking with you at your side even in this moment. So, I have to find my spot here. Okay, so the next thing is do not worry. We all have an issue for worry. All of us have a problem with worry. Some of us more than others. And I'm not going to... I know, I know someone in the crowd thinks I'm going to call her out and I'm not going to do that. Uh, <laughs> but we all have a problem with worry. And see, there's lots of things in the Old Testament that talks about worry. There's lots of things in actually Psalm. The Psalm scripture for the first meditation kind of touched on it a little bit. But this is what Pastor Robin would call the red letters, and what the King James is in red letters. This is Jesus' message, one of Jesus' messages to us. Matthew 10, 29, 31 says, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? 
yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And even if and even the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. On the surface of that, I'd like to offer you a challenge this week. Small challenge, promise. When you go home and you have some downtime during the week, try to count the numbers of hairs on your head. <laughs> try. If you get past the hundred, you're doing good. Okay, but the fact of the matter is that God cares about you and I so much, so much, that He has the very hairs on our head numbered. God cares about you and I so much that He was willing to send His Son to die on a cross for you and I, which we celebrated as Easter last week. Jesus Christ is our Savior. Amen? Jesus Christ is the one who came to redeem us. Jesus Christ is the reason why we're here today. The reason why I'm up here, the reason why this church is even standing today is because of Jesus Christ. And if we hold Him in that high reverence, as we should, for Him to say something like, the very hairs on your head are numbered and He compares us to sparrows. Obviously this is a parable because He's not going to sell us for pennies here. But the fact of the matter is that He's telling us don't worry because I am with you. Don't worry because I have your back and you are worth more than you could ever imagine. Maybe not to the people around you. Maybe not to the crowds you, you see in, in Walmart or your, even maybe even your family. But you are worth more than many sparrows and more than you could ever imagine to him. I want to talk about one more. Actually, it comes from Matthew again. It's four chapters to the left there. Matthew 6, 25 through 27. It says this, again, Jesus talking. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air, they do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And you, are you not much more valuable than they? Can you, any one of you, by worrying, at a single hour to your life? I know the bottom part's chopped off there. But there's a lot in this too. Jesus talks about, again, nature. He talks about the birds of the air, talking kind of a little bit about the sparrow there. Okay, sparrow's a little tiny bird. Um, and Jesus wants to remind us that worrying is not only a problem to our spiritual lives and our, and our mental state. It's also a problem to our physical lives. And what I find really interesting about this is that Jesus had no access to a, a you know, WebMD. He had no access to a you know, cardiologist, had no access to any of this. And yet he knew that it was bad for us. If you look and you look, go home, Google it or whatever, whatever you do, uh, go home and, and, and look on the internet about worry. You'll find that worry is a huge problem. Some people try to escape it through different means, pills and, and such like that. And other people try to, try to receive help from the cross. And some people take their hand and let Jesus walk with them. And that is what you and I are here for today. See, we, as Christians, must never, ever forget who Jesus is. The two pillars there are, again, that God is with us, God will take our right hand, and do not worry. I thought about myself in this when I worried, and actually there was something that came to my mind, and it was, um, it was actually something that happened to me couple of years ago. So I decided when I was 16 years old, I found the Lord and I decided right then, I mean right then, that I wanted to be a minister. I knew it from the second, okay? So I didn't realize at the time how much effort that involved. I didn't realize how much schooling I'd have to go through. I didn't realize how much I had to learn. You know, when you first find Christ, you think, I, I'm good. I'm beam me up, you know, I'm ready to go. And that, that's sometimes what we think. 
but we know it's not that way. So if you're not familiar with the way that you become a pastor, the way that that works, typically there are some newer ways coming out. But the best way, in my opinion, and the typical way is to get your bachelor's degree, then you go get your master's after high school, of course. And so when I was in high school, I, I, we were attending a church, and I did not know that at the time. But I told my pastor at the time, I told him, I said, I met with him, had a nice talk with him, and I said that this is what I want to do. How do I do it? Because I didn't know. And he says, well, you know, you have to go, and you've got to get your bachelor's, and then you get your master's, and then you can be a pastor. And I'm still in high school, mind you. I said, oh, no problem. No problem. I got one year left of high school, no sweat. Go straight to college afterward. So as college got closer, I thought, all right, I don't know if I like this. But I did. I enrolled in Cumberland County College, and I was upset because I hated school. I hated school since I was like in kindergarten. I still hate it to this day. It's just a fact of my life. And so <laughs> I remember I, I started going. It was great. Then I had realized that I wasn't learning anything. That was a big problem. You know, you could basically write the alphabet on your paper and the teacher would give you 100. That's basically what it was like for me. And so I said, you know, this is not good because once I get to the next level, I'm going to be lost. I will not know what I'm doing. So I said, you know what, I had one semester left at Cumberland. One semester. I was enrolled. I was almost done. And it was actually the spring semester. It started in late January. And I remember I, I was at home and I said, you know what, I'm not doing this anymore. Forget it. There's got to be another way. Well, side note on that is that I knew that this, as soon as my pastor at the time told me this is how you do it, I knew that's how I was supposed to do it. But I tried because I was worried to find another way. Well, you know what happens when you try to find an easier way? Usually it doesn't work out. That's what happened to me. I sat down with my pastor at the time, different from the previous pastor, and I talked to her and I said, I can't, I said, I can't do this. I, I, I need another way. She said, okay, no problem. She said, well, there is uh, a school offering from the denomination that I was a part of, and it's real simple. You just go every Saturday, three hours. It's real cheap, real easy going. And once you're done, two years, you become a pastor. But caveat is, is that it's only good for this denomination. It's not good anywhere else. And at the time, I was friendly with everybody. Everybody liked me. I said, no big deal, no problem. So I started. I dropped out of Cumberland, totally, and I decided that this is what I was going to do. Started going. Everything was great. Then, lo and behold, I had six classes left. It must be something about the number five or six. I don't, I don't know. But I had five or six classes left and I had a huge falling out with the pastor, the district superintendent, which is the head honcho in charge of the whole district of that denomination, which wouldn't have been a big deal. The problem is at the end of the courses, he has to sign off and say, you're good to go. Well, that was not going to happen. So I decided that I had to go back. I didn't want to. I decided, but that's what I had to do. So I started attending here, talked to Pastor Robin. He uh, said, go back, get it, you can go to Wilmington, you can do it online, you'll be fine. I said, okay, this sounds easier. So I did. I went back, started Wilmington, and I have five or six classes left, but I'm not making the same mistake this time. Uh, but nevertheless, that's, that's what happens when we try, to, when, we, when we worry about things, when we don't remember who is in control, when we don't remember that God is with us, even if God has told us, this is what you are to do. This is how you do it. Just do it. Nancy Reagan up there. Yeah. <laughs> Just do it, right? Well, I knew that that's what I was supposed to do, and I didn't do it. So, but we all have those moments. Have you ever had any one of those moments? Right. Just do it. So, the two pillars again. Don't forget that God is on your side. Don't forget that God is with you. The second pillar is don't worry. Dream big and don't quit. If any of you are like me, you are visual learners. Who's a visual learner? <laughs> good, most of you. Okay, good. So I learn most 
from YouTube. That's where I learn a lot of my stuff uh, because I can watch it. I'm not forced to do it. It's very kind of easy going. You can do other things while you're watching it. It's good. Well, as I was thinking about this message and as God placed this on my heart, I remembered a, vid a movie. It was called Facing the Giants. Have any of you ever seen that movie? Oh, okay. I'm surprised. Good. So Facing the Giants, for those of you who don't know, which is most of you, Facing the Giants is a football movie about, it's, it's, it's a Christian movie. It's about this mediocre, I think it's a high school team, maybe? Yeah, okay. High school team, and they are going to face the Giants, not the NFL Giants, the, the football Giants in the movie. And they don't think they can do it, because they're kind of like Cumberland Regional. And um, so they're not, they're not quite sure they're going to be able to do it. And there's a main guy on the team, his name is Brock. Brock is kind of like kind of like us. So as you watch this clip, I want you to picture yourself as Brock, Jesus as the coach, and the man on Brock's back, I want you to picture something that you quit on, something that you regret, something that you carried in here today. Okay? Okay. Go ahead and roll, Stacy. message to you today is quite simple. No matter where you are in life, no matter where you come from, no matter where God has called you to go, no matter who he's put you with, no matter what church you're in, we thank you that you're here, but no matter where, no matter what God has placed on your heart, no matter if you're on the 10 yard line, the 20 yard line, the 30 yard line, or in the opposite end zone, when God tells you to go, remember that He is with you and He is constantly saying, do not quit. Do not give up. Keep going. And that is the message to you this morning. As you leave these doors, may you never quit on the thing that God has put on your heart, the promise that God has given to only you as His creature. And may you always know, always that He is with you, and there is no need to worry. Amen. Let us pray together. Dear Lord, as we come to this quiet moment, we thank you that even though we quit even though we get to that 50-yard line and we say, we don't have any more, we can't do it. We just want to quit. You are there telling us to keep going. We thank you that no matter what regret we carry with us or no matter what burden, no matter what our cross is in this life, we thank you that we can come to you for strength, and stamina when we need it most. We thank you for the many blessings in which you give to us, and we thank you for giving your son on the cross to die and rise again for each and every one of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here's a few reasons why people don't go to church. 
I can't come to church until I get my life together. Church is how I got my life together. Church is filled with a bunch of hypocrites. And there's always room for one more. All they care about is your money. They care about me, not about my money. Is there some kind of dress code? Yes, the code is wear some clothes. Church, it just makes me nervous. I was nervous at first, and then I felt right at home. I'm not sure I believe everything that you believe. But you can still belong. Church is for wimpy, girly men. You want to say that again? If you knew me and what I've done, you wouldn't want me. If you knew me and what I've done, you wouldn't be worried. You can come to my church even if you were brought up Catholic, Baptist, Methodist, Jewish, Mormon, Lutheran, Pentecostal, Presbyterian, Church of Christ, Southern Baptist, a little bit of everything and a whole lot of nothing. See, it's not about a religion, it's about a relationship. So please, come to my church. Where nobody's perfect. Where beginners are welcome. Where socks are optional. But grace is required. Where forgiveness is offered. Where hope is alive. And where it's okay to not be okay. Really.